Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the notorious RBG, a pop culture icon. A complicated figure, a Supreme Court justice who became an unlikely celebrity. I am nearly 84 years old and everyone wants to take a picture with me. A woman criticized for being politically divisive. Recent comments by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg about Donald Trump have even some of her supporters wondering if she went too far. But whose best friend on the bench was her ideological opposite, Antonin Scalia. You know, what's not to like? Except her views of the law, of course. <laughs> Some liberals wanted her to step down under Obama to give him a chance to appoint another justice. But it wasn't in her character. I want to see what your workout is. Let's go. There's even a Hollywood movie about her early experiences fighting for women's rights. It is a cage, and these laws are the bars. Ginsburg proved instrumental in breaking down piece by piece a rigid framework of gender discrimination woven deep within American law. And of all things, cases dealing with money became a central tool in her arsenal. From government benefits, to pay discrimination, and the simple right of being considered fit to take over a deceased family member's estate, Ginsburg often focused on economic gaps to make the case for equal rights. So much had been made of differences between the two sexes that she had to expose how customary thinking about what was men's jobs, women's jobs, and responsibilities discriminated against individuals. In 1971, Ginsburg was a law professor working with the ACLU. At the time, many banks still denied women credit cards unless they had a male cosigner. Only 43% of women participated in the labor force, and those who did participate made on average 40% less than men. Ginsburg's work helped change that. Her first major Supreme Court victory came in 1971, in a case called Reed versus Reed. In the case, a separated married couple from Idaho had been fighting over control of their deceased son's estate. The mother and father, Sally and Cecil Reed, both applied to be administrator of the estate. But Idaho named the father because the legal code explicitly read, males must be preferred to females. The mother's lawyer argued the state's law was unconstitutional because it violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Ginsburg was looking for a gender discrimination case making an equal protection argument like this. Because that was the same argument Thurgood Marshall had used to secure his string of civil rights victories from the court. So Ginsburg and the ACLU began helping the wife's legal team writing a brief for the case's Supreme Court hearing that sealed the deal for a historic ruling. The total value of the estate? No more than $1,000. She was conscious of having to move slowly from larger to larger sums because, of course, uh, the opposition always argued, well, in effect, this is expensive, you know, if you apply gender equity. So she was very conscious of the money involved. But the dispute over that small estate changed legal history in the United States forever. The court's seven male justices sided unanimously with the wife, setting a major precedent that the Equal Protection Clause applied to women's rights and prompting legislatures to revise hundreds of state and federal laws. It's since been cited in no less than 56 subsequent Supreme Court decisions from cases expanding abortion rights to ending male-only admission and rooting out gender discrimination in pension payments. Her next major case, Frontiero versus Richardson. This new case centered around a woman serving in the military denied the same benefits given to a male serviceman despite the fact that they served alongside one another. This woman was an Air Force lieutenant named Sharon Frontiero. Frontiero was married but realized one day that she wasn't getting a housing allowance like her married male counterparts. When she brought it up to the Air Force, she was told she was ineligible because her husband didn't depend on her for more than one half of his income, 
a requirement not levied on Air Force wives. I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. The verdict? Another victory for Ginsburg. As Ginsburg continued to build out her various legal challenges, she embarked on a savvy judicial strategy of also showcasing men harmed by gender discrimination. Although that strategy earned her criticism from some women's rights activists. We'll hear arguments next in 73-1892, Weinberger against uh, Weisenfeld. The case's plaintiff was Stephen Weisenfeld. Stephen's wife, Paula, was the primary breadwinner in their family. She worked as a teacher and regularly paid into Social Security. But after Paula tragically died during childbirth, Stephen sought Social Security payments to help him stay at home and raise their surviving child, benefits that would routinely have been granted to a married mother in the event of a father's death. But Stephen was denied Social Security and ended up taking his grievance to the court with Ginsburg's help. In her argument, Ginsburg drew attention not only to this widower harmed by the law, but also to how that law demeaned the worth of his late wife's work. The strategy paid off in court. Ginsburg secured another unanimous ruling from an all-male panel of justices. The point she was making in some of these Social Security cases that you could not discount the fact that the wife had always worked and you could not discount her labor and her earnings. It counted. It was essential in many households. From behind the bench, Ginsburg also made her mark on the fight against gender discrimination. This time, it came down to a woman's right to a paycheck. In a case called Ledbetter versus Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, she wrote one of her most famous dissents. The pay discrimination case pitted an Arkansas woman named Lily Ledbetter against the massive Goodyear company. After working at Goodyear for 19 years, Ledbetter had found out from an anonymous note that she was making hundreds less every month than even the lowest paid man in her position. She sued Goodyear for sex-based pay discrimination under the Civil Rights Act and won. But then her case got tangled up over a question of whether the statute of limitations had lapsed. In a split decision, the court ruled in Goodyear's favor. But to Ginsburg, this decision was deeply flawed. In a stinging dissent, she outlined how the court's decision overlooked some of the most common characteristics of pay discrimination, like the fact that it often occurs in small increments and remains hidden. She concluded, the ball is in Congress's court to fix the problem. Soon after, Congress acted on Ginsburg's challenge, passing the Lilly Ledbetter Act in 2009 and extending the statute of limitations. I signed this bill for my daughters and all those who will come after us because I want them to grow up in a nation that values their contributions. From Ledbetter versus Goodyear all the way back to her first Supreme Court brief Ginsburg's knack for zeroing in on issues surrounding money changed legal history in the United States forever. <laughs>